thank you so much for joining this RTS lunchtime session on why we love reality TV. And believe me, with the panel that we've got, we genuinely do love reality TV. Now, reality is a genre that pulls in so many demographics across television. Uh, and actually, it's one of the formats that young people physically watch live nowadays, a thing that a lot of companies are struggling with at the moment, especially with streaming services. So we want to get right down to the heart of it, why we actually do, as a society, love reality television. Reality television has been uh, part of our lives for a long time now. And not only has it affected the way that we watch TV, but it's also affected social media, the way that we actually interact with these shows. Uh, and also it has created some of the country's biggest stars. <clears throat> cough, cough. So uh, without further ado, before we meet our panel of actual reality royalty, uh, we are going to be having a little look now at a VT created by Alicia Nguyen, an RTS bursary scholar. Take a look. Can 12 strangers work together to build a bridge to the money? We are the winners! Oh, that was really cute. Right. Would you like the opportunity to take one of them on a date? Yeah, Francesca. Home record. So the past few days have given me a lot of time to reflect. I've come to the realisation that I'm not being true to myself. I've overlooked certain situations which I wouldn't usually do. Holly, I know you're my best friend, but I'm a winner and I feel like you're a loser. <laughs> this is a disaster. You should have owned up. You should have been an adult. You should have told her. Are you, you should have told her after the party. I should have been an adult. I was the one being an adult trying to give her respect. Who is she? Who is she? Where did you find her? Why, I, why do you always do this to me? I just, just tried no, to do something. No, no I'm you. defending myself. I came with her. I'm oh, leaving yeah. with her. You're not wanted. Excuse me, neither are Goodbye. you. Were you not going to call me to say ta-ta? <laughs> What am I talking about? Your sister's going to jail. Have a little compassion. Would you stop taking pictures of yourself? Your sister's going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> what goes on tour stays on tour. <laughs> haven't we all indeed i mean we could just watch an hour of reality compilations and i think we would all really really like it but i did promise you guys a uh esteemed panel of people here today that we are going to be talking to and i think we should actually meet them all now so first up we are going to say a massive hello to katie manley a woman i have worked with for many a year now she is the md of initial tv showrunner on Big Brother for over 10 years. Uh, Katie, it's lovely to see you this afternoon. Hi. Hi. How are you? Great, thank you. Good, glad to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Now, Katie, tell us what you're working on at the minute, uh, initial. So, well, last month we made Soccer Aid for ITV, which was a big charity fundraiser, which we raised over £9 million pounds for UNICEF. So that was good. Uh, and we're gearing up to go back into studio with our daytime quiz, Tenable, which is on ITV as well. We are prepping for um, a big, new, exciting ITV show that's coming up next year, and then lots and lots of development as well. Lots of Quite stuff. Busy. Indeed, always spinning plates is Katie Manley. Katie, I've got to ask <laughs> you, what's your favourite reality moment ever? Well, um, I don't want to be sort of too revoltingly self-indulgent, but it's a big brother one, I'm afraid. Oh, uh, that's fine. That's absolutely dead. fine. You know, it's got to be David's dead. So that's obviously that iconic moment where there was a case of mistaken death uh, amongst the housemates on Celebrity Big Brother. Um, and it was just 
actually one of my absolute favorite moments of possibly of my life not even just a reality tv <laughs> yeah but but in terms of tv also i'm like well one of my real favorites was jillian mckeith as well when she and one of her bush took a trial when i'm a celeb so two of my faves i could go on for hours i won't I mean, we all could, though. I generally think probably my favourite day at work ever. Uh, Katie, we'll be catching up with you in just a second. Next up, uh, it gives you great pleasure to introduce to the call Richard Cowles. Richard, how are you? Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Very well. Lovely to see you, Richard. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Richard, for shame on you, uh, but he is the Director of Entertainment at ITV Studios, the makers of I'm a Celebrity, Love Island, Richard, I've got to start with the news of the fire break that's just been announced in Wales. Uh, you guys are all currently up there at the moment prepping for I'm a Celeb. Uh, how, how's that all going? Yeah, good. I mean, uh, COVID is the gift that keeps on giving in terms of challenges, <laughs> isn't it? It's, uh, uh, we're rolling with the punches and we kind of just have to adapt and we keep, keep adapting and we're still sort of waiting to hear exactly what that means for us, but generally... Yeah, we're just rolling with it and carrying on. So it's, it should all be good, I think. Fingers crossed it will. We're all looking forward yeah. to it. Uh, and Richard, I've got to ask you the same question. What's your favourite reality moment? Well, do you know what? It's the same as Katie. It's Gillian McKeith fainting. I was in the gallery for that moment uh, when she fainted and Deck was looking down the barrel and I'm going, uh, should we go to a break at that <laughs> point? <laughs> yeah, so that was quite a, uh, quite a big moment, both personally and TV-wise. Absolutely, it was. Uh, Richard will be catching up with you in just a second. Thanks, mate. Uh, but let me now introduce Rick Murrays, the Managing Director of Workerby in Manchester. Uh, Rick, lovely to have you on the call. The Bridge, loving it. Thanks, Rylan. It is yeah, really, it's really been, good. We're still in the middle of making it or getting it delivered anyway. It's, uh, we're literally sending it on like a, a Friday to Channel 4. It's going out on a Sunday. <laughs> it's only got commissioned 12 weeks ago. It's so, crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy how quick turnaround, especially in reality, is happening at the minute. But but a bit like Richard, you've you've been working in Wales. Like, is Wales the new reality hub of the country? <laughs> uh, it has been this summer. Um, I think for us, if we, for for season two, maybe Vietnam or Patagonia might might be might be nice. We'll just sack not it off. We'll I, all not, do it in Barbados. Looking against <laughs> North Wales, it was wonderful having a location that is an hour and a half from the office here in Manchester. That was great. And Absolutely. it looks fantastic. The rain was a bit, you know, shaky yeah. at times. I mean, you, you, you give and take, you give and take in the coronavirus. Uh, no, honestly, the series is amazing. Rick, I've got to ask you, your favourite reality moment? Um, I think it, for me, it has to be, it's a little bit old school, this, but it has to be Nasty Nick. Oh. Way back in the, in the first ever series of Big Brother. Just because I don't want to give anything away, but we, we have a sort of a similar situation coming up in the bridge um, with vote outs and plotting. And it just totally took me back to that first season of Big Brother. And it was, do you remember how big that was? Someone yeah. dying to get someone out. Can you believe it on a reality show? It just felt like a political scandal. Well, that's the so, thing. Yeah. Like something like that back then, you do that now and it's like, yeah, standard and what? Like well, just back the then game, it was like, it? get the fire sticks out. Yeah. What's he done? <laughs> a great moment, a really good moment, Rick. Rick, we'll catch up with you in just a bit. Uh, and finally, uh, it's lovely to see Craig Orr on the call. How are you, Craig? Hi, good, thank you. How are you doing? Lovely to see you, mate. Uh, Craig is the VP Original Content and Development uh, Youth Entertainment for uh, International at Viacom at CBS. So Craig's behind shows such as Geordie Shaw and X on the Beach. Uh, Craig, youth, it's like one thing we all miss, to be honest. Uh, but <laughs> it is the word of the day at channels, at streaming services, everywhere. What, what are you making for the youth at the moment? Um, we've just launched uh, last week a couple of uh, reality shows uh, which are digital first. So we've launched um, Celebrity Bumps, Mike and Perry, which is following um, Mike and Perry, um, their, their journey through pregnancy. And we've also just launched MTV's Living the Dream, which is um, following four of the guys from last year's Love Island, which is Michael, Chris, Danny and Jordan. Um, so it's all, they've been shooting it all themselves on their iPhones over the summer and we've been cutting it together and um, it's really good. So that's what, that's what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, also, we're also planning um, a big, we're big plans next year for Geordie Shore's 10th birthday. 
Well, I was going to say, I mean, Georgie Shaw is just, did you ever think that it would get to where it's got now? Well, I didn't, I didn't work on it from the very start. I came in um, around series four. Um, whenever I started working on it, the, that cast, they were so incredible and brilliant and um, they just kept giving and giving. So um, kind of, yeah, I did, m m m maybe, the pe maybe my predecessors um, didn't, didn't see it coming, but um, that cast were, are just incredible. Well, it's amazing, and the spin-offs you're getting from it as well is, is such great content. Um, Craig, I've got to ask you, favourite reality moment? Um, so I'm going to go for a much more recent one, which is the whole of the final episode of Love is Blind, um, <laughs> which were all of the weddings. Um, I'm not going to really pit, pinpoint one, just in case anybody watching hasn't watched Love is Blind yet, but I was, like, edge of the seat is, like, <laughs> perfect to explain how I was. I was screaming the whole way through. So maybe I would have to say that one. That is a good choice. That is a good choice indeed. If you haven't seen it, make sure you watch it. It's a good one. Uh, well, guys, thank you so much for, for being here this afternoon. It genuinely is a pleasure to, to be speaking to you about a subject that I love. And we know people that are, are watching along with us love as well. Um, so I think we should really talk about what what is reality TV. We all think we know what reality TV is. But how would you define it? I mean, Katie, let me start with you. Is it more complex than other genres of TV? We know there's a lot more that goes into the producing of it, especially quick turnaround. Well, I, I, think, I don't think it's a mystery. I think a simple definition is that reality TV is non-scripted programming using real people. Um, and I think it's sort of, it's come, it's come a really long way and it evolves and it's evolved since, it's, since you could probably pinpoint the start. And I think, you could even say that reality TV was something like Candid Camera in 1948. That, that's kind of, you know, back in, in, in the States, that was one of the first shows that used real people to play playing pranks on them. And then it, obviously that came over here. So I think it's sort of, a, it's an it's an evolution and I think it, it continues to evolve. Um, I think just saying kind of it's real people doing real things is an oversimplification because actually, what is produced to look real is also evolving now. So the people might be real, but the situation's maybe becoming a bit less real, but I don't think that makes it any less exciting. I think, you know, we're sort of putting them as producers in, and people into a wide variety of sort of constructed situations. Mm. Um, but ultimately, the essence of reality TV is real people. And I think that is why it has, has always been popular and will continue to do so. Um, you know, it's just always going to be interesting seeing real people, I think. Hey, do you think the fact that because it is real people, it gives that sort of synergy with the viewer thinking that could be me? Yeah, I do. I think so. I think it's I think it's a mixture of relatability. So you can totally, you know, you're always going to be like, oh, what would I do in that situation? Or oh, that person's just like someone I know. Or it's like, I have never seen anybody like that in my life. You know, so I think it, you kind of get the within a cast you know you aim to have a cast that has people who are surprising and people who are relatable I mean a lot small besides but um I think it's it's, it's the cast that makes reality tv absolutely uh Richard let me come to you actually because I want to talk about longevity with reality because there are so many formats I'm a celeb big brother so many formats that have really stood the test of time what do you think it is about the reality format that people still want to completely have? Do you think it's a case of it being new every season? Yeah, I think it, I think it's the new mixed with the familiar. I think um, with something like I'm a Celebrity or Love Island or Big Brother, all of these shows, you're, you're in a familiar environment that has built up over years and years. But with every series, you've got a new group of people going into that environment and a new discoveries and how are they going to behave and I think what Katie was saying that relatability is at the heart of all of this where you're you're watching the people on screen and you're kind of going what would how would I behave in that situation would I do that would I eat the pig's penis to feed camp would I you know what, what why would not I, why not <laughs> <laughs> you know but that's it and I think it is that relatability I think we are fascinated by people and I think being able to come back night after night, especially with a lot of these shows, to see how people are behaving and to create those, those ongoing narratives, which we even as programme makers don't know where they're going to go. That's the thing. They're very reactive. 
They're very of the moment and they take us all by surprise. I mean, I'm sure everyone else on the call would agree that, you know, you think you've got a plan when you go in and you rip it up on day two because everything changes. And I think that's what's so great about it is it feels real and it feels authentic and it feels exciting because you just don't know what's going to happen next. Absolutely. And I think Craig as well. I mean, we're talking about formats there as in that the format always returns yearly because people love the familiar familiarity of it. Um, but always with a new cast, whereas something like Geordie Shaw, you have your sort of core cast members. I know you introduce people and sprinkle people through series, but what do you think the success is when it comes down to Geordie Shaw, that people are invested and they still want to come back for more with the same people? Yeah, I, th I think that was a big advantage of Geordie Shaw that they did keep coming back because you get to see you get to see them time and time again and you know we we were filming every six months we were going in twice a year and these you know they started off they were between 18 and 22 and we really over the last 10 years are watching them grow up getting into relationships falling in love you see the whole relationship you see the end of the relationship and you see the closure and then on to even new relationships so it's you know you can't expect um a million different things to be happening to every single cast member at, at one time in each series. But what you do get with um, returning casts is, um, you know, it, you may be in a happy relation, you, you, may, you may be in one place, one series, and it could be radically different the next series. And mm. therefore the viewers just want to lap that up and learn what, what you've learned, what, you know, what's new, what, what, what's happened. Um, so it just, keeps you know just keeps people really really infested in in those cast members definitely and i think it does it's, it's this as much as there's storylines to everything they are real people whether or not they're produced or not in in whatever sense they are people that people invest in and we talk about the longevity of these shows that have been running for so many years because we love the format we love the show but rick I mean, every channel, streaming service, person who runs the post office, they want a new reality show. And it is a hard format to crack, especially one that's going to have the longevity of some of the shows that we've spoken about. We know you're doing The Bridge at the moment for, for Channel 4. How hard is it sitting in that room with, with your development team and, and coming up with this idea that you want a channel to buy? Yeah, it's really hard because ideas have kind of life, life spans and they have moments to be pitched and to be commissioned. Um, I think like if, if we hadn't had COVID this year, we wouldn't be making the bridge. Like, it's, a, it's a reality show that's been sort of created in the moment for the moment. But what we're hoping is we can build off the back of that and have a successful long running reality series. And, you know, it's very, very green shoots at the moment. And even just letting the audience know that it's a reality show has been tough because people are like, what is this? So they, like people were genuinely disappointed that it wasn't a bunch of civil engineers building a bridge. And because we're in quite a blokey Sunday night slot on Channel 4, we're trying to bring young women to what is basically a reality entertainment show. You know, we're finding that just getting the messaging out there and getting people to come to it um, is, it's happening, but it's sort of been a, you know, a slow, soft start. Um, but, you know, in terms of like the, the bridge itself, obviously, we went into Channel 4 like three months ago and said, look, here's this, we've got this cool reality game show that we can make now. And wouldn't it be great for people to tune in in the autumn and see a group of strangers coming together to work as a team? And there's something like right now, like it's almost like, you know, the stuff of fantasy, being able to mm. hug a stranger and work with them together for the greater good. And that was really you know, how we pitch the bridge and why we're making this now. But it's, it's hard. We've got another show coming up next year Idris Elba's Fight School, which is again, very of the moment. It's like young disillusioned kids being brought together into a fight school to sort of get them out of a life of crime and teach them to fight, which does sound a little bit counterintuitive. But again, it's kind of very of the moment. And, and it's like how you then build on that and create a sort of long running brand like Richard has and Katie has with Big Brother. That's, it's really, really tough, actually. So mm. you've just got to take the big swing and hope that it pays off. And I think more fail than end up still on TV in 10 years' time. Absolutely. And I completely agree. And it is about that longevity. How can you make it so people want more of it? 
um someone that has done that we know richard with with i'm a celebrity we're, we're all looking forward to it it's sort of a staple of the year i think it's like yep yeah, just chuck them in camp because they can have it worse off than we've got it out here at the moment but you're in development now you're you're in the series all you guys are setting up in wales at the moment and these restrictions have obviously changed the shape of tv i think and i think we'll all agree for, for the foreseeable future uh, going forward when that comes down to cost implications whether it comes down to the way it's shot but how are you guys adapting to the pandemic that we've got going on especially with one of tv's biggest shows yeah well i mean for a start we're in we're in wales uh which which was which was a big kind of um a big change for us uh but actually with that i think with all of these things you just have to to, to go with the flow and embrace the changes. In some ways, us doing it in Wales is really, really exciting and is a kind of a new challenge. Certainly we're having to sort of build a completely new location in a fraction of the time that we normally would. Mm. Um, but there's a real energy amongst the whole team kind of going, okay, well, let's embrace this. You know, what are we gonna do? This opens up a whole new range of um, opportunities you know what does i'm a celebrity in wales look like that it can't look like in a in a jungle in australia but i think the big thing about covid is it puts a massive massive strain on the production team and as we all know even just this lunchtime the rules change daily yeah. and what you have to cope with is, is 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 difficult and it's hard to contend with i mean we've got a really good team who are sort of putting in place and adapting and evolving I mean, the key thing is that we create the safest possible workplace for, you know, crew, cast and, and our hosts. Um, but it's, it, it isn't easy, I suppose. But the good thing about reality shows and the shows where you put the cast in a bubble is that they are, you know, as with the bridge, you, you, can, you can kind of put them in a space where they can be reasonably sealed from outside interaction and... You know, certainly we've been finding with uh, different shows that, you know, like Love Island in America and Germany have both managed to produce over the summer. Um, so I think there, there is adaptability within the format. And as long as you can get the, the off screen stuff right and keep that COVID safe, it, you know, there's an opportunity for everyone here. And I understand that technology is going to play a big part in this as well because as as the times are going on i mean you go back to 2000 2001 there was none of the technology really that we've, we've got at our disposal today but how's technology playing a part in that richard i mean we've had uh, amazing i mean we you know we've on a covid level everyone's got proximity monitors on them so basically they can't come within two meters of each other without it without it buzzing and flashing and reminding them to step away from each other I mean, can i get one of them just to it's stop going to be very boring <laughs> stories from behind the scenes this year i must say uh, but the uh, you know so that's kind of off screen but in terms of the technology we've uh, for example with the castle itself we've mapped that completely remotely so we can do a, uh, we can get all of our camera positions and everything done uh, off-site without having to, to go there. We've basically created a whole virtual walkthrough of that castle. Unreal. So that all, of the, all of the set can be built remotely back here uh, in, in, and then transported up there. All the camera positions, the lens length, all of that sort of stuff can be done. Uh, we're even going to have our edits in London to try and reduce the number of people uh, traveling to Wales and to sort of reduce the number of people that could potentially spread COVID. So, you know, we couldn't have done that, but, but fiber technology means that we can send everything back, uh, edit it in London and, uh, and then send it back again. So it, it's an amazing, it's amazing how technology changes the environment that we work in and what we can do. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we all talk about technology being a development, but Craig, let me come to you because Reality TV has really developed over the years. I know Rick was talking about obviously the Nasty Nick situation in Big Brother One and it being such a massive deal. Whereas you put that in, I don't know, Big Brother 17 and people go, all right, well, you, you had a pen and what? Like it, it's not a, a, the biggest thing in the world no more. How have you seen reality television change across the years that you've been a part of it? Um, 
I think the big I think the biggest change of the last um, ten or so years is is social media mm. and the internet. So you know, I know Richard's talking about the technology and how that's improving to be able to film in different places and faster and the workflows. But um, from a consumer side, like the so- social media is like really really um, change change the game. For reality TV, in terms of getting closer to cast members, being able to, um, you know, find, uh, you know, talk with other fans and keep a conversation going through it. Um, I think without social media now, um, I mean, all, I think all reality TV shows need to be able to have a massive um, social media footprint, and I think that's probably from a network side when the you know shows wouldn't be considered without that potential. Mm. Uh, so I'd say that's a massive, you know, that's how things have changed in reality TV. Um, world world view or world politics can, you know, some would say that that can have an impact in terms of um, tone um, for shows and what people, what people actually want to be watching um, after they've been watching the news or if they've had a stressful day at work and what they're reading about outside. Um, what do people then want to get out of their entertainment? So I think there are um shifts depending on what's going on in the world as well absolutely katie i mean talking about social media but working on big brother social media can actually influence the game the show real time you know you can have flash votes you can decide what housemates going to be evicted you can have you know what what the outcome of a task is going to be based on a live there and then vote via the app online twitter whatever how much has that changed and, and shaped the show? Well, I think it, it kind of shapes the show um, as, as much as you want it to, in a way. I think, you know, you can you can really embrace it and use it um, during the show and to influence events um, because that is real-time audience reaction. Or, you know, in a show like Big Brother, obviously, you have to pick and choose how much you want to let the outside world in. I think it really does influence things um, for people when they come out. I think um, it's a very different world, isn't it, in terms of trolling and bullying from the when, from when it first started. I think that, I mean, that is really key, I think, for people going into reality TV to be on the shows. I'd say that is the biggest sort of change probably from when it started to how, you know, the, how they get um, received by the public, really. Mm. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. And Rick, I mean, Katie just said it then, you know, social media is a fantastic tool for any reality show. And I'm sure with the bridge being on at the moment, hashtag C for the bridge, you know, you can look at all the comments that are coming in in real time as a producer, as an exec, as a whatever, and actually see as it's going out live, not even having to wait for ratings to see what people's reaction is. But as Katie said, sometimes the reactions that are coming through live aren't what you want to be seeing for you as a company, for you, for your contestants, for the people that are taking part. How much do you prepare contestants for that eventuality? Because unfortunately, we do live in a world where we unfortunately expect it. Yeah, I mean, quite quite a lot, basically. You know, it's I mean, it's really important. You know, as producers, we can watch that kind of thing with a thick skin and understand that what you see on Twitter is a very small vocal minority it's it's not kind of like an actual democratic poll of what people think but in terms of the contributors you've got to be really careful and um i know that gareth our brilliant psychologist who also worked with katie on big brother and also worked on love island is sort of really um uh you know um experience uh, uh beforehand and after giving that care to the contributors so that's a combination of preparing them for the inevitable yeah. negative comments that they're going to see and hear on social media and then being on hand to talk them through it when it inevitably does happen. You know, just by putting yourself on a reality show on TV, generally, you're going to end up with some people not liking you. You're also going to end up with lots of people loving you. Um, and so it's really, really key to sort of listen to the, the comments that you want to listen to and, and try and coach the contribs to not listen to the others but as we all know that's easier said than done isn't it yeah and, and you know everyone takes a negative <laughs> comment or a negative review or whatever everyone takes it to heart so 
it's tough. Yeah, I think yeah, you, know, you have to. I think you have to really prepare them for, for everything. Um, but especially, um, you have to just give some real good social media steer because I think that's the, that's the one of the big big um, hurdles that you have to face coming out of a reality show. I think, and I think it's really really important that you support them in that as much as possible. Absolutely, and you know, Rick, sorry, you can say something. I was just going to say it's tricky as well because you're, you're contributors specifically on a reality show are usually there because they've dreamt of some kind of fame of 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 having an audience of having fans and it is and it is that platform for people who kind of want to be famous to put themselves forward and show themselves to the world and so ultimately as well they're going to potentially be more disappointed sometimes by audience feedback than say I don't know if you're making a documentary about someone who's an expert in a field and just pops up on that documentary, but they're just doing their job. So it can be water off a duck's back, but these guys are putting themselves out there going, look at me, look at my personality. I'm taking part in a reality show. And so it could be quite hurtful for them specifically sometimes. Absolutely. And I think that's the definite downside of social media and sort of being a reality show contestant, if, if that makes sense. But Richard, let's look at the, Plus side, because over the past 20 or so years, over the past two decades, reality TV has launched careers of a lot of people. And I'm talking people that have got to such levels now where they are seen on the same level as presenters that have been doing it for years or pop stars that have been doing it for years. It's how much do channels and sort of services look at reality shows and look at the talent that comes out of them to maybe shape the future of them channels? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, obviously from uh, with Love Island, we've had lots of success on that front. I mean, Olivia Atwood, we we're about to um, release a new series with her that comes out, ITVB 25th. Uh, and that's Olivia meets her match with her fiance Bradley up in, uh, in, in Manchester. And, and I think, the reason that the channel would go for that is because since she appeared on Love Island, she has steadily built uh, a profile, whether it be on TOWIE or on other shows that she's done with us. And people, an audience travels with her. And I think in this world where the audience is being divided and divided again and divided again, if you can launch a show with someone that will bring an audience and bring an audience with them, I mean, it's been it's been the same with it's the same with any host. If you can if you can have someone that's popular and that's going to bring an audience to a new show, then that's really really important. And we've had a lot of success with with both um, you, you, unknowns who've then made their name on Love Island, or from people who've been on I'm a Celebrity and, and have perhaps been known for one thing, but then get a relaunch and a slightly different career off the back of it. I mean, you know, Harry Redknapp was only known for his his football managing, but then now you see him do lots of other different things as well. So I think like there is a real... Jam, jam roly polies. Jam roly polies is a big old thing. <laughs> so I think, I think that's, that's the trick. And it's always been, you know, you, you put a star in a Hollywood film because they'll bring an audience. Well, it's the same with this. If you can have uh, someone who has proven themselves popular and will bring an audience to your show, that is of, of huge value to a, to a broadcaster. Absolutely. And I mean, like Richard just said, you know, something like I'm a celebrity, we already sort of know these people for something, but it can sort of excel their career to maybe a different avenue that they wouldn't have had if it wasn't for the show. But Katie, looking at a show like Big Brother, especially Civilian Big Brother, it literally launched ships. It really, really did in the <laughs> industry. It took people that were completely unknown and turned them into household names earning a lot of money, changing their life completely. What do you think the secret is to, to actually finding those contributors and turning them ultimately into celebrities? Uh, I think it, it is referen referencing back to relatability. I think um, often audiences like, um, you know, a lot of the winners of Big Brother were, were the sort of good guy. Um, more guys than girls I think but um, you know they I think the viewers really really like um, to see somebody go on you know the sort of overused word journey within a show and I think if they can really relate to somebody and really like them and someone proved themselves to have behaved in some sort of 
moral way, I think that really kind of wins over viewers. I think then, you know, they, if that person has been proven to be a good person, then they kind of can move on and do something else or an interesting person at least. Yeah. And I mean, when it comes down to casting, Katie, diversity is a massive thing. And how important is it to you as the person in charge when you're looking at casting these shows to make sure that you've filled the diversity that you want to feel? I think it's just about, um, you know, we want, we would always want to cast a show in the most diverse way possible. Um, and I think it's about firstly giving everybody who might be watching someone to relate to. And that's a lot of different kinds of people. And, um, you know, exposing audiences to people who don't look or sound or behave like them as well. And I think, I think it's not only important just to sort of have that in a programme, but I really believe that in doing that, it broadens the people's horizons. And I think it helps everybody watching to see beyond face value. And I, I really passionately believe it genuinely has a transformative effect on society. I think, you know, it's not a coincidence that, um, you know, many of the more diverse housemates in Big Brother won the hearts of the viewers and went on to win their series. And I think it's sort of, it's kind of gaining, just, you know, gaining acceptance in public and over the years. We've done that a lot on Big Brother, you know, we've kind of, we've moved, moved things on, I think, um, and lots of reality shows as well. But just, I think, you know, the more that people are exposed to different kinds of people, the more accepted different people are. Craig, I want to come to you on that, actually, because we obviously talk about Big Brother, I'm a celebrity, sort of shows that have a sort of turnaround cast each year. Whereas something like Geordie Shaw, it has the core cast, the returnables, people that do keep coming back. How important is diversity to, to, to your show when it comes down to sort of BAME communities, the LGBTQI community? How, how much do you really look at that when casting sort of new housemates? Yeah, um... In, like incredibly important just as Katie was saying like not only about representing the audience but it's also coming from and um, you know appreciating that the more diverse cast we have the richer the story stories that we can tell within it the more stories and the better the better the output essentially when it comes to something like Geordie Shore um, diversity was super key and we really worked on um, always making sure that was important. Um, we've had, you know, coming out stories. Um, we've had, you know, we've had lots of different people go through the Geordie Shore House. Um, and again, it's part of, um, you know, our, our viewers want to, you know, just want to see themselves represented. They want to learn about other people and they want to see those people, I'm going back to the growing up thing, but coming out as a, um, you know, part of growing up in your 20s um, for Nathan, that was a big key moment in his life. And for the viewers and the fans, it was really important for them to see him do that and they got behind him and they supported him even more. And also really, really, um, to Katie's point, transformative in terms of watching how the other um, straight cast members in the house reacted to him and responded to him with open arms. And I think it really does, you know, to Kitty's, like I agree completely with Kitty, she, it does change people's minds. Absolutely. And Craig, you just mentioned there, obviously you, we've seen the coming out stories, we've seen the relationships. I mean, in certain countries of, for example, Big Brother, we've seen the live births, like we've seen it all um, across the world. For those people out there <laughs> that say reality TV is dead, it's, you know, we've seen it all. God, how many more times can I see this? What What do you think the future of reality is, Craig? Um, well, I certainly don't think reality TV is dead. As long as we have, you know, a brilliant um, reality TV um, workforce in the UK, which we do, and always finding incredible new cast members who aren't afraid to live their lives um, on screen for better, you know, all facets of their life as well. I think that's really key to um, fans getting behind cast members to get them to see the good, the bad, when they're happy, sad, angry. Um, so I think as long as we keep um, doing that, I think it's, I've kind of forgotten your question, but I think um, 
there's no end. There's no end. The future. That, that's a good answer. It's a good answer. It's a good answer. Rick, I want to come to you on that as well because you know, like like Craig said, there's there's no end to reality TV because reality is real. It's real people <laughs> out there in the real world doing what they do just on screen, whether that be in a format, in a house, in a village, in a whatever. What do you think the future holds for reality? I think it's here to stay, isn't it? There's a you know, as a genre, I think everyone thought it was a, a flash in the pan maybe 20 years ago, but it's absolutely like a, a fixed item on whether it's, you know, going to be traditional TV channels in the future, probably more likely, you know, the success that we're seeing now with the, with shows like Too Hot to Handle on Netflix. The difference is that people are going to go and find their reality in different places um, on different platforms, but I think that as a, as a genre, it's definitely here to stay. It appeals to you know a, a young demographic. It appeals to a real a cross section of society because it, as Katie said, with the casting, it reflects society back at people, and people enjoy that kind of soap opera um, drama. And you know, actually, the soaps for for many many years sort of provided that in the schedules, but reality TV provides that as well, and that's why you know, the shows that Richard makes and the shows that uh, Craig makes, you know, they just get that loyal viewership coming back time and time again. So yeah, it's gonna be here in 50 years time. It will just be on some sort of platform that no one's predicted yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, this is very strange that you say that because you mentioned Too Hot to Handle, you're mentioning platforms that no one's invented yet. Richard, streaming services, they are in more words than one, so the future it's it's how we're seeing things move people are watching tv very differently now people aren't always doing appointment viewing they want to watch it when they want to watch it how they want to watch it all episodes in one go bish bash rosh thank you very much like that's how it's going how do you think the future of reality will sit in that type of context yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, th there is a slight change, and I think it's really changing for traditional broadcasters as well. I think everyone is wanting a big, grabby hook for for whatever you're pitching. That first show is the key thing. What is, you know, how are you going to pull the rug from the contestants and surprise them and the viewers? And creating, I think, in a world where there are a lot of reality shows. You really have to try and create something that is going to uh, make more noise than all the other ones. Um, and that's what a lot of the, the, the streaming services do really well. And they kind of come up with that big thing. At the end of the first show, you go, oh, well, I've just got to watch the next one now. And I think, but that's the same for everyone. And I think it's, it's quite similar to what we do on shows like Love Island, where you're, where you're across the week. And at the end of each episode, you need to have some dramatic moment that's going to bring people back the next day. So I think the skills are the same, but but it's really about for the streaming services that show one and kind of what is that sort of moment. And I also think the audience are much, you know, they're very clever, the audience that watch these shows, because they tend to watch all of them. And they they kind of know all of our tricks and they know how we make the shows. And I think they want to be surprised. They need to know, especially in the sort of competition uh, reality genre, they need to feel like you're moving it on in some way or you're doing something a little bit different or a bit surprising. And they're quite hard to surprise. And I think that's why it's very difficult to come up with sh new shows like this because you really have to sort of come up with something where people go, oh, okay, you're doing that, are you? Um, Otherwise, we'd just be churning them out. But sadly, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> soon, soon enough. Don't worry about it. We will, we will. Do you know what? I could just see everyone else on the call just going, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you bang on the button, Richard. Um, before we go to questions from a load of people watching, thank you so much, obviously, to everyone watching this. We are going to get to your questions in a second. But I just want to ask you guys what's next, because, you know, I'm nosy and I like to know what's going on. So, Rick, what's next for you guys? Yeah, I think I'd sort of name dropped it earlier, but we're, we're doing a big um, project with Idris Elba where we're setting up a, a fight school in London. And so so COVID permitting, sometime spring, summer next year, we'll be holding lots of big fight nights all over the country with his group of uh, Team Elba, his group of young fighters, which is pretty exciting for us. And we're also doing a big Netflix project with Olivia Buckland, who won 
Love Island. I think she win Love Island. She was a big star of Love Island anyway. A fashion project for Netflix. She won in the right. end. She won in the end. <laughs> she, she's exactly won right. now because she's on Netflix. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Rick. Katie, we know you were working on a big show for next year. What can you tell us? Not a lot. Say nothing. This is I've had this for years. I've had this for years from this comment. I can't tell you anything. No, no, I can't say about that much, but it's gonna be good. It's gonna be big, really big. One of the big ones for next year, I reckon. And um we're doing loads of development. We're just um really sort of putting a lot of time into uh, reality because everybody does want it at the moment, everybody wants more reality, and it is really hard to crack it in a, in a sort of new, fresh way. Um but we are, yeah, we're putting some time into that at the moment. And um, any any uh, word on a house, the, the room that looks like this at all? <laughs> you know the answer. No, no, nothing to nothing to announce at the moment. <laughs> Every week, that is the answer I get. Nothing to announce at the moment. No, they always text me any news. I'm like, <laughs> <"Now> what? <laughs> Darling, I've got a mortgage to pay for. No, Jay. Uh, right, Richard, what about you? Uh, well, there's the Olivia Atwood show coming up on ITVB, and um, I'm a Celebrity is keeping us all very busy at the moment. And yeah, lots of development, lots. I'm sure we're all rotating around the, uh, the, the same commissioners with ideas that are going to be the next big hit. Um, and hopefully they will be. <laughs> I'm sure they will be, especially with you four. Uh, Craig, how's it all going at Viacom? What's next? Uh, big big plans for Geordie, as I said, for next year for the 10th birthday. Also, uh, really happy with how Celebrity X and Beach did this year. So um, looking at that, we are spending a lot of time developing and trying to find new casts, um, new families, new different precincts that might be interesting, but new groups of people that people will want to watch. Um, with the Kardashians going, there's definitely room for a new reality family. Um, and also developing lots of other house-based um, shows like X in the Beach or True Love or True Lies. Absolutely. Well, good luck with it all. Uh, a lot of people have been watching this today and they're getting in touch now. So brace yourself, guys, because uh, I'm the nice one. I don't know what these lot are going to be like. Uh, I haven't got any names here at the moment, but I have got a question coming for all of you. Uh, is there a key formula to creating a great reality show? Uh, I mean, quite an open subject there, an open-ended question, but let's let's find out, Rick. I think twists and turns, dilemmas. We've already said relatable characters and, and a, a cast that people will get behind and love. But, um, you know, for us, creating The Bridge, it was uh, creating a series of cliffhanger moments and big dilemmas that you'd watch and you'd be like, you know, what what would you do? Um, as sort of Richard said about about eating the pig's penis, you know we've had our own versions of of that on the bridge, and and they get kind of bigger and bigger, and you know um, what the, it's the, the penis or of, the game? <laughs> we haven't got any penises, <laughs> but we have sort of you know, are you going to be selfish or are you going to or are you going to sort of be on the side of the team um, and some big twists and turns? So I think that's the main thing is the drama. It's got to be dramatic and it's got to be relatable. Anyone else got anything to add to that formula? It sounds like a winner. It is drama, it's, it, you know, I think um, I think reality TV is underrated and that people just think, okay, we're just filming what happens. It's, you know, if it was that simple, we'd all be out of a job. I mean, you know, we are very much, you know, even in the purest of sort of formats where it's as unproduced as possible, it's everything, you know, is, um, you know, you're generating everything. Um, and I think, you know, it's like, a soap opera in, in lots of ways you know you really really want to see formula is you want to see drama you want to see conflict you want to see humor you want to see um sort of pathos you know you want moments that are sort of poignant and sad and people opening up about stuff in their lives so i think you know while even things that aren't produced you really want to see all those beats that you'd want to see in a drama series or in a film i think that is the formula to sort of replicate those human emotions that everybody relates to and see them play out before you yeah, and I think that like the other, like with the saturation of reality TV as well, it's like something we're like, we're always looking for. It's like, what's the USP? Like whether that's the big, as Richard said, like the big F1, the big hook, or what's the tone of this show? You know, like people are, you know, fl you know flicking through and can last like four seconds and make up their mind. So how does your show look different? And how is it also going to, 
how you're going to make an impression within those four seconds. That might just be in the look and feel of it as well. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? It's it's weird actually because I was going to ask this question myself, but and I know. I think I know where the answer is going to be, but a question's just come in. Is there a potential for archive reality shows to come back on demand on catch up? Um, what, do you, what do you mean by archive? Old, old series of old shows? Yeah. Do you know what? I think, uh, I think, of course, there's always that potential, but I think um, for sort of well I think for contributor care it's a really really difficult one I think you know people who have signed up to be on something 10 years ago um don't necessarily didn't necessarily envisage that their series would be played back out in their you know they were a wild young thing and then now they're sort of you know a headmaster of a school it's, I think you have to be very very mindful of individuals um lives and think whether that's the right thing to do yeah, and also it depends on how how old we're talking because it might look absolutely rubbish. On yeah. <laughs> no, I have to have say, like, the... sorry, go Richard. On. No, you go ahead, Craig. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, as a as a fan watching, you know, you, Rylan and Katie this year, your Big Brother, you know, the Big Brother best episodes ever really did make me want to watch some of the like series to like a few different series i would have watched them all back to back yeah i mean we, i know people would and you know it's not it's of course something that we we've talked about um it's just really you know and it's not out of the question but i think you have to just be really careful with people's yeah. um, privacy and yeah. Just their, their care because I think the the care process of, of having a contributor onto the program it, it starts the minute they apply for the show and it you know it would end very very far afterwards and if you're still sort of showing something many years afterwards it's it's, it's complicated and, and it's not impossible but I think it's just a primary and mm. really do you know what I think we've got time actually for, for one more question I'm going to direct this to all of you as well um this is from Ganesh. Uh, will there be a closer convergence between scripted non-scripted reality shows in the future? Sorry, you were breaking up a little bit there. I, I didn't get that. Uh, Apologies, my bad. Will there be a convergence between scripted reality and non-scripted reality? Do we think we'll see a closer synergy between them as the years go on? Hmm. I think there's always a place for both. I think if you look at the the range of, you, you know, you asked at the beginning, what is reality TV? Well, it is such a broad genre that I think there is everything from the very sort of purist Big Brother where it's a social experiment, uh, or, you know, right up to some of the more constructed um, uh, formats. And I think, you know, you can have everything in between as well. So I think there's room for it all and and I bet that we won't even predict what will be the next big hit because that's going to be the one that takes us by surprise absolutely absolutely um well guys I genuinely can't thank you all enough for doing this this has been as a little reality geek myself like a nice little afternoon for me <laughs> um so Rick Katie Richard and Craig a massive thank you for you for giving up your time to talk today and a massive thank you to everyone uh, at home watching along we hope you enjoyed this uh, thank you so much for all your questions I wish we could get through uh, some more but keep supporting the reality industry because um, it is a, a fantastic industry to be a part of and uh, fingers crossed 2021 will be a, a really great year for, for all of you um, and uh, let reality keep leading the way that's what I say guys thank you so much for being on the panel thank, thank you, you. Yeah, thank thank you.